Thank you, Mr. Deputy Pack. Welcome back to our session this morning. And uh, I'm going to write a bold word up here on the board. I do not remember when I first heard this word for the first time. I do remember when I heard it, I was glad I heard it where somebody actually pronounced it because I wasn't sure how to pronounce this word. Um, D A R A G I G M. This is not my notes. I was thinking of this uh, just a few seconds ago. The word is pronounced paradigm. A paradigm is the way that you and I view things. They, a paradigm, let me use this analogy, is the lenses through which we see things and hear things. Uh, there are a lot of paradigm shifts going on in our world right now. Some are major, some are minor, but a, a paradigm shift, for example, uh, I've noticed in church architecture, for whatever reason I just caught in my mind, church building architecture. Church buildings today in many locations do not look the way the church buildings looked 50 or 100 years ago. Church buildings look differently. It's a paradigm shift. If you go over to Europe and you, you see these massive cathedrals, etc., they don't look like what we're meeting. It's a paradigm shift. It's how we view this location where we're going to worship God. A paradigm shift takes place with regard to styles of music. I, I travel enough where I'm, I, I'm still trying to define what is meant by this is a contemporary worship service. Uh, I, I, I have yet to come up with an adequate definition of what a contemporary worship service is because what may be contemporary in Morton, Illinois would be out of date in another part of the country. What may be contemporary in Morton, Illinois may be far ahead of where uh, paradigm shift with regard to worship style in southern Illinois or in southern Minnesota or whatever. Paradigm shift takes place all over the place. And I, I think what happened to me was many, 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 many years ago, I don't know, 30 or years or so or more, there was a paradigm shift in how I read the book of Revelation. And what I presented to you last week, I dare say for some of you, was a paradigm shift. Because I know how I was presented the book of Revelation was, you read Revelation through the lens of this book tells us when this event is going to take place, and when this event is going to take place, and this event, and this event, and we can check these events off and know that we are that much closer to the Lord's final return, we are that much closer to the end of the world, if we can check, just check these things off. But years ago, quite frankly, I began to realize, and I, I would use a strong word here, the bankruptcy of that approach. Remember last week when you were with me, I brought four or five books that gave a historical overview outlining that particular approach, used the book of Revelation to predict the end of the world, and all these people have the same thing in common. They've all been wrong. Every single one of them have been wrong. And, and so I'm not optimistic that if we continue to read the book of Revelation with the viewpoint that it tells us in great detail, or even in general detail, when our Lord is going to return in light of particular situations that we are misreading this book. I, I don't think it's a legitimate way to read the book. Now last week, this, this week sometime, I got an email from one of you. And you asked me a very, very good question. Good question. Why are people obsessed with trying to use the book of Revelation to know the future? And I have thought about that question since you asked me that on Monday or Tuesday of this week. Why are people obsessed with this? There are a lot of answers to that. I'm going to give you what I think is the key one in just a few seconds. But one reason why people are obsessed with that is if they've grown up with a paradigm that the book of Revelation is a prophetic book and the dominant emphasis of prophecy is to predict the future. That therefore, it's legitimate to read the book that way, and I'm obsessed with reading the book that way, to find out when this event's going to take place, when this is going to take place, and when this is going to take place. So that's one way, one reason why people are obsessed. They do not know any other way to read this book. Now, let me just digress for a second or two on this. The approach that I'm teaching to you, last week and this week, finds its roots deep in the history of the church. This is not a new Okay? This is not a new approach. I can trace the approach that I take 
back to about the second century AD. Okay? Now I do not, I'm going to use an illustration here which is going to provoke some of you. Okay? In a positive way, I hope it's going to provoke some of you. But but I and I'm I'm only using it as an illustration. Uh, I'm going to develop this more fully in a third volume that I'm working on, that I'm going to work on after I finish the commentary. But let me give you one illustration. One quick illustration about a paradigm shift. Most of you have heard about the doctrine of the rapture of the church, I dare say. And sometimes that doctrine is called the secret rapture of a church. That, that, that before a number of things take place, those who are faithful will be raptured, and the left behind will be those who will go through seven years of tribulation, persecution, opposition, whatever. Now, I'm going to be very specific when I say this. I'm going to be kind when I say this. I'm going to smile when I say this. <laughs> the doctrine of the secret rapture of the church was invented in the early 1800s. Nobody ever believed that until the 1830s. Nobody. Now, I want to live the cell just for a little bit, okay? That is so much of a challenge when I say that in American churches. Nobody ever believed in a secret rapture of the church until the 1830s. That had been documented by historians. And I know that will be a shock to some of you because I grew up with that doctrine. Did any of you grow up with that doctrine without raising your hand? I grew up with that doctrine. But you can, I can take you back to, I can take you back historically to Glasgow, Scotland. Margaret MacDonald, at a prophetic conference, had a vision of a secret rapture of the church. Nobody ever believed that until Margaret MacDonald came up with it. And I can trace for you how that has developed over the last decades and how it jumped upon the United States of America through the preachings of Dwight L. Moody and Henry Blackstone and other well known events at the end of the part of the 20th century have become solidified in what is called the Schofield Study Bible, the Schofield Reference Bible, and the Rhymer Study Bible, where before 1830, nobody ever believed what so many American Christians believed about the church, about the rapture of the church. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that. That's a pretty major paradigm shift when you realize that a hundred million copies of certain books have been sold based on the doctrine that was invented in the 1830s. Likewise with the book of Revelation, you see, you ask me the question, what if you ask me the question, why? Here's what I think goes on. is the issue of control. We want to know the future because that is a means by which we can control and have insight or not. I think it goes back to where? The Garden of Eden. To desire and presume a knowledge about end time events that God does not permit us to have or want us to desire. Am I making sense this morning? I totally reject any efforts to try to guess when our Lord Jesus is going to return. I completely refuse to listen to or to read anything by anybody in which they tell me they've got it all worked out. Now that sounds very firm, very, I may be bordering on harsh, but I will not waste my time on that approach. It is a dead-end approach. Because what the book of Revelation is concerned about is not so much knowing when he's coming, but recall knowing that he is coming. Not knowing so much knowing when he is coming, but know how to live between the first coming and the final coming of Jesus Christ. I am convinced that as there were surprises at Christ's first coming, so there will be surprises at his final coming. I think, I think if the Lord Jesus were to return, I, I will say, now wait a minute. I, I, I confess this to you. The Bible said, now wait a minute. That doesn't fit my paradigm, God. I thought, 
this is going to happen. I thought this is how it's going to take place. I think there will be some surprises, Bob, that, that, that if we, you and I are alive when the Lord Jesus returns, we'll say, well, my goodness. I, I think it will not be unlike... Do you remember reading some statements in the Gospels when Jesus would say something and then a Gospel writer would say, they did not understand this until after the resurrection? Until after He ascended to be in the Father? I think the same thing is going to happen with regard to the final coming of Christ. We will look back and say, ah, now... We understand what that passage meant. Okay? So what I'm presenting to you is a paradigm shift on how to read the book of Revelation that goes against so many people's approaches to how they read the book of Revelation to predict the end of the world. I don't want to talk about the end of the world, but how the end of the world impacts the way that I live right now as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so since I believe that repetition is the mother of wisdom that I shared with you last week, let's take a real quick review, a real quick review before I get into some new material. Take a look at your Bible, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, and Revelation 22, verse 7. I do not know if all of you were here, if, if some of you were not here last week, but I need to set the stage with you, Revelation 1, verse 3, and 22, 7. It's like, it's like a bookend at the beginning of the book, and the bookend in the last chapter of Revelation 1, 3, from the English Standard Version, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed those who hear and who keep or obey or heed what is written in it. If you have the New International Version that translates it, take the heart, kind of write a little line through take the heart, and right above, obey or heed or keep, because that is the better, clearer translation of that verb that John uses. It is the identical verb, look at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. If the identical Greek verb, if I can pull out my Greek language for you, that's found in 22, verse 7, that's found in verse 3, that means heed, keep, or obey. I think I said last week, it is the identical verb that is found in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, you baptize and teach them to obey all things, to keep all things, to heed all things. And so at the heartbeat of the book of Revelation, of this marvelous prophetic work, is that prophecy is primarily proclamation from God about what God would have us to do with our lives right now in light of a future that belongs completely, totally to God. This book is to be obeyed, which means this. Whenever I read the book of Revelation, no matter what paragraph I'm reading, what section I'm reading, I look for somewhere either embedded or explicitly stated a call to obedience, to be an obedient disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to build on that considerably this morning. The, then, then I want to review, rather quickly, moving from 1.3 to 22.7, the five or six key principles I presented last week. Okay, that's a good review, is helpful for us, because it sets the stage you're going to see for what I'm going to cover in the new handout today. Point one, you recall last week, if you brought last week's hand out, if you did not, point one was we placed the book of Revelation within the scriptural stage. So remember I wrote on the board over here the word story, S-T-O-R-Y, that there's an overarching story in the Bible. I define that as God wants to be in relation with Him. He'll do whatever it takes to get that relationship going, to keep it going, to bring it to completion and perfection. And then I said each book of the Bible has a story, capital S, little T-O-R-Y. And within each story of the book of the Bible, there are embedded stories, okay? There is an underlying unity. There is an underlying unity. For example, when you come to the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22, we can get so caught up in the detail of the new Jerusalem, of the new heaven and the new earth, that we miss the big picture. The big picture in chapter 21 is God will dwell with us. And no matter what that dwelling place will look like, no matter what our resurrected body will look like, the key point that John is stressing in chapter 21, 22 is that God will dwell with us and we will dwell with Him and we will dwell with each other in a new heaven and a new earth. That, that fits in with the Genesis story. Interestingly, as some of you realize this, the Bible begins in a garden in chapter Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and it does not end in a city, it ends in a garden. If you read Genesis 20, Revelation 22, 1 through 5, the book of Revelation ends with, in a garden. In other words, it's like, remember 1, 3, 22, 7, book ends, call to obedience, call to obedience, 
the Bible, there's one massive book in it. One book in Genesis 1 through 3, the garden. The Garden of Eden, relationship with God. Revelation 22, 1 through 5, 1 through 4, we end up in the garden, relationship with God. That then we come full circle, basically. Okay? The scriptural stage is crucial for us to understand the book of Revelation. That there, um, and what I did, what I did this last week, and I went, I went home and I thought, okay, now, what are some snapshots of the Bible? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you some snapshots. Bob, when I finish with this, I'm going to give you these transparencies and put you in photocopy and the people want to stop by the office to get this going in. Here's what I did. Here's what I did the other day. I sat down and I thought, okay, now, what if somebody at New Life Church would ask me, what are the snapshots of the Bible? What are the highlights of the Bible? What are the major events, the major people, the major scenes that we need to be aware of? Because we cannot, we'll, no matter how much we study the Bible, we'll never be able to master Scripture. We'll never be able to master it. Every, every story with little s, but but we can get the we get the big pictures like a photo app, okay? So I thought, uh, and in fact, I was I was putting up photo albums the other day that are found in our closet. And I thought, oh my goodness, we have got to go through and edit this because we've got too many pictures of this family vacation. Go give the highlights. So I thought, okay, let me give you the highlights. Okay, you don't need to write this down because I want to get the transparency to Bob. But here here's what I want to bring up. Here's the snapshot from Bible. Okay? Now I start with Abraham. I couldn't go back to the Garden of Eden, but I decided to start with Abraham. The call to Abraham, where God enters the covenant relation with Abraham. You've got Abraham, you've got Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the Exodus, the desert wanderings, the Israelite under Canaan, the conquest of Can inner Canaan, the conquest of Canaan, Joshua dies, judges begin to rule, Saul becomes king, you have King David. You have Solomon the temple built, you have the division of the kingdom, you have the exile of Israel, you have the fall of Jerusalem, and the first return of Jerusalem. Okay? That's the big picture. That's the big picture. Okay? So far. Page two. You've got the completion of the temple. You've got the second return of Ezra. You've got the third return of Nehemiah. You got Jerusalem's walls being rebuilt. You've got Malachi being written. And then between between the Old and New Testament, you have a blank page usually in your Bible. Between the Old and New Testament, you have a blank page. That blank page represents about 400, 450 years of, of history in which there are no prophets, there is no scripture being written, but a lot happens. It is during that period, for example, that the synagogues develop. There are no synagogues in the Old Testament. But during this 400, 450 year period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that you've got synagogue developing. It's between the, four, between the Old Testament and the New Testament that you have Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, I don't want to digress because I teach a course on that link in the called Reading Between the Lines of the Family Life and Bible Times. It's a cute little course. And it's a teaching of students Bible history. And say so this 400 year period is crucial. You see, what happened in the land of Israel is they're controlled by the Persians. And then they're controlled by the Greeks. And then you've got a family called the Hasmonean family, the Maccabees, who are warriors who fight against. Greek control. And then, then you've got the Romans coming in. I just gave you the big picture of the Bible history from the call of Abraham up to the coming of John the Baptist. Now here's what's remarkable about that, students, is this. These events, these people, these events, they're all alluded to in the book of Revelation. All of these are alluded to in the book of Revelation. Because what John is trying to communicate is the story that John tells us in Revelation is the story which links up with the other 65 stories of the Bible. Is the story which links up where God wants us to be in relationship with Him. Okay? Are we on the same page here? Okay? So the book of Revelation was written to help us see at the end of the first century when, when the, the apostles are dying off, when the, all the New Testament writings are going to be completed by the end of the first century, we're going to say, okay, we've got the total package now. We've got the complete Word of God. We don't have to look for fresh revelation at all. We've got scripture, we can take it to the bank now and say, okay, we've got sufficient enough information in the Bible, what we call the Bible, we'll hold the New Testament. To understand the capital story, to understand the story, to understand how our stories fit in with the overarching story of the Bible. The second principle that I gave to you last week was the story setting, the story setting of the book Revelation. You recall, I put up on the overhead projector a transparency. I don't know if I dropped this. I cannot remember if I brought this transparent piece of it. You recall, there's the Roman Empire in John's day. Powerful empire in John's day. There's conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome. 
The church basically spreads wherever the Roman Empire is by the end of the second century. As the church grows, the kingdom of Rome cannot stand in the opposition, and so there's conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome. And one of the reasons why Revelation is written was to help us live faithfully in the midst of that conflict. To recall that I shared with you that there were two dominant threats facing the Christians, rather quickly. One threat was the threat of persecution or tribulational opposition. Okay? For example, if you if you and I were living in the first century, in the second century, here's what Christians were accused of. Christians were accused of being atheists. Are you aware of that? They are accused of being atheists. Now, we define atheist as someone who does not believe in God. In John's day, an atheist was someone who did not believe in God. My, see, definitions change over centuries. We say an atheist is someone who denies God, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham. The Romans would say no. An atheist is someone who denies the God of the sun, the moon, stars, mountains, springs, trees, forests, rocks, hills, animals, warrior gods, gods of wisdom, etc. And so we are accused of being the atheists, which means that we're in the minority because the bulk of the world would worship a variety of gods. And so the Christians had no business saying that their God was supreme over any other God. The Christians, basically, are you familiar with the word pluralist, pluralistic? Basically, the Christians live in a pluralistic culture, much like our culture, where how dare you say there's only one God? How dare you say there's only one way to salvation as through Jesus Christ, God's only Son? Now, do you understand that's where we are in our culture, aren't we? How dare you say that so-and-so is not a representative of God? How dare you say that this particular faith, this particular religion, is not a valid faith in which people ought to pledge their lives to? Well, well you see, it's because we are considered to be the odd people out, even in our culture, as the Christians were back in John's day. You know what else they were accused of? They were accused not only of being atheists, but they were accused of being anarchists. Anarchists. Anarchy. Because they said there's only one king, and his name is Jesus, not Caesar. Not Augustus Caesar, or Domitian Caesar. There's only one king. And we follow his kingship. We obey his commands. His commands, his kingship trumps Roman Empire commands and kingship. You know what else Christians were accused of? They were accused of cannibalism. Why cannibalism? Lord Supper. Eat the flesh, drink the blood. The non-Christians did not understand that that was symbolic of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection under sacrificial death. And so we Christians back then were accused of being cannibals. You know what else Christians were accused of? They were accused of incest. I am CEST. They accused of having inappropriate relationships with members in their family because we called each other brothers and sisters. And we met in secret. And we met in secret because the culture pushed the church underground in secret. And so it had to be secret. And so therefore, his teachings were misunderstood. And so you've got these Christians, you see, who are being pressed with those four accusations, both in John Day, the second and third century. And so that's why Rome then made war against the church. They reviewed the threat to Roman peace. Have you heard of Pax Romana? Roman P, Latin phrase, Pax Romana, the church was a threat to Pax Romana because it would not pledge allegiance to the Roman Empire as a god. Okay? So, let me give you an illustration of that because we probably won't get into it in great detail today. In Revelation 13, there's a beast out of the sea and a beast out of the earth. For John's readers, I have no doubt, and in fact, for the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries after John was written, here's how the Christians understood the beast. The first beast is Revelation 13 with the anti-Christian Roman government. The second beast in Revelation 13 with the anti-Christian Roman religion of worshiping the emperor of God. That's how they interpret it. Okay? They didn't say, oh my, there's going to be a beast in the year 2009 or 2008 or 2015 or the 21st century. They saw that the beasts were alive and well in their day. I'll come back to that point in just a short moment. I'm going to give you an analogy show you relevance to that for us today, okay?
So one threat was tribulation, persecution. The other threat member, what I call cultural seduction. That is, the church was being tempted to compromise with the cult in which it lived. If you take a look, if you take a look at Revelation 2 and 3 sometime, just on your own, it's really interesting to do this. Read through Revelation 2 and 3 and make a list of temptations that the early Christians were facing in the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And here's some of the temptations they were facing. I just wanted to give you a partial list. One temptation they were facing was idolatry. In other words, some Christians were being taught it's okay to worship other gods because that's the way the rest of the culture does it. And you can worship both Jesus and God as God, but you can worship other gods as well. In other words, worship other gods. Okay? Another temptation facing gospel background in those days were, uh, was the Roman culture was a very deceptive culture. This is really fascinating to read through. I read through Revelation a thousand times. As I read through the Bible, then maybe the Chinese as well. But one of the things that's fascinating about the book of Revelation is read through and see how many much attention there is paid to speech, to lying, to tell the truth. False prophets lie. Jezebel is a false prophet. Balaam. The stories in the Old Testament that John says are being relived in his day lie. Remember in Revelation 21, verse 8? It says that uh, there is a list of those people who will not be found, who will be cast in the lake of fire. Liars is one of the categories. Because the revelation of knowledge, what you say reveals who you are. If you speak untruth, if you speak lies, it shows your character. It shows the kind of person you are. A third, a third, so, see, so everybody in the culture is lying. So why go to the church? Just go ahead and go along with the culture. Does, that, does this sound familiar at all? Okay, you know, hedge the truth, shape the truth, you know, keep you out of trouble. Or thirdly, thirdly would be the issue of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Uh, where if you read Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and chapter 8 and chapter 12 and 13 and 14 and 17 and 18 and 19 and 20 and 21, I just give you all the passages that I off the top of my head, or maybe a few others, in which there's speech about sexual morality that was present in the Roman culture and how it was beginning to propagate the church. Okay? And, and so one of the temptations facing the Christians back in those days was to go along with culture in order to get along with culture. And rather than a counterculture influence, rather than a counterculture influence, it compromised the culture. Okay? The third principle that I gave you last week was the principle of the style of Revelation. Remember, it's three kinds of literature brought together. It's a prophetic work. What's prophecy? It's primarily prediction. No. It's primarily proclamation. But it's also called an apocalypse. It's also called an apocalypse because that word apocalypse means revelation or disclosure. And it is a revelation given in symbolic language. And it's also a letter to John, to the seven churches, to the province of Asia. And so when you weave those three kinds of literature together, those three genres together, they were genres that were very familiar to the people back then. What was not familiar to them was bringing all three genres together in one book. In one book. Okay, I'll come back to that because I need to move to the fourth principle, the sources. Um, somebody came up to me last week, one of the music people came to me last week and said, are you familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the black spiritual genre revelator? John the Revelator is really a deep song. John the Revelator. Well, I, I think John, not only the Revelator, but John's a recycler. He recycles the Old Testament passages. He recycles. He reinterprets. He reapplies. Now, now get those three words. He recycles. He loses the Old Testament. He reinterprets. In other words, they may have had one meaning, Bob, back in the first in, in, in the sixth century BC or the 10th century B.C., but in John's day, he said, I'm going to re reinterpret, I'm going to reapply this, so this piece of Scripture speaks to us today. It's not unlike what you do on a Sunday morning. Where if you preach the Old Testament, what do you do? Do you keep it only in the past tense? Do you only keep the Old Testament story, how it spoke to people back then? No. You bring it and say, here's how it speaks to us today. And then what you do, that's what good preaching is. Good preaching is taking an ancient text and applying it to a modern world. Okay, what John does is John takes ancient texts. John takes ancient, I need to write that down before I talk. Okay, 
take his idea of it quite this way. John takes ancient texts. It's pitiful when you have your teacher taking notes on his slide. <laughs> and applies to modern people. Okay? John takes these ancient texts of 2,000, 3,000, 3,500 years written earlier, and he says, okay, now I'm going to take those stories you know, I'm going to reapply them. He says, ah, says it was in Daniel's day, as it was in Abraham's day, as it was in the Garden of Eden, so is it in the first century AD. Okay? So John is a, 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 a recycler, he's a reply, re, recycler, reinterpreter, and re, uh, I, I, he reapplies, okay? I, I'm actually taking those myself right now. Forgive me, I did once, but I had to do that. I had to do that, okay? Otherwise I'll lose it. Let me give you an example of that. Turn to Revelation chapter 8. Look at Revelation chapter 8, and... Uh, Let me read to you Revelation chapter 8, beginning with verse 6. Now the seven angels, who have the seven trumpets, prepared to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were drowned, thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters become, become Wormwood, and many people die from the water because they made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Now let's pause here for a minute. They said, oh wow, it, 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 I don't know what to do with this. Now, now remember the key to interpreting that? Is to look at the Old Testament passages. Wormwood, for example, comes right in the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. You may not know that, but it comes right in the book of Lamentations in Jeremiah. But I've got to ask you this. As I read some of those images, did any particular event in the history of Israel come to your mind? Tell me more. Moses going to Pharaoh in the Ten Plagues. Fresh waters turn to blood. Darkness of the sun, the moon, the stars. You got it, Mike. Exactly. Okay, now, now listen to me. Here's what John does. As God judged Egypt in the plagues, right? John says God will judge for John's people who they need to be told who's going to be judged. Roman culture. As God judged Roman culture because it stood against God's people, what will God do to any culture that judges God's people? God will judge cultures. Now, now here is a critical point. Here's a critical point. John takes literal events. He takes literal events, Mike, like the plagues of Egypt to present profound spiritual truths. That as God judged Egypt in the plagues, so God will judge Rome. As God judged Rome, so God will judge any godless culture. That the timeless nature of the Old Testament stories. Am I connecting with you? I told you last week, I give you a heads up, we're going to go deeper this week than we did last week, okay? I'm taking you deeper, so stick with me. Because what I'm going to be doing is I'm planting this seed right now. I'm going to come back and show you more about that in a few minutes. So if you miss it the first time around, I will come back around in about 10 or 15 minutes and I'll give you another example. And after a while, I'm hoping you'll be able to say, aha, at 9.45 today, this finally clicked with me. Okay? So Mike, here's what happened. Mike, let me see if you picked up on that. In John, see, you, you and I know the edge of the story. We were talking about the ten plagues. We were talking about the Passover lamb. Right? See, John's already alluded to the Passover lamb in Revelation 1 when he talks about Jesus he freed us from our sins by His blood. He freed us from our sins by His blood. The Passover, the blood of the Passover lamb, brought freedom to the to the Israelites. Okay, so we know those stories. But when I refer to the word like wormwood, 
We may not know that from Lamentations or Jeremiah or word where it's even found in the book of Job or the book of Psalms. Why? Why may we not know that? That's not a trick question, by the way. Nobody's preached on that. We've not taught that in Sunday school class. We've taught the King Blanks. We taught David and Goliath. We taught, you know, we taught Daniel the Lions then. But nobody has preached on certain of those stories. And just because we thought preached doesn't mean they haven't heard the preaching on those stories. And so they would have picked up and said, oh yeah, that connects with that. That connects with that. That connects with that. Okay? Do you remember when we repeat what I said last week? Every book of the Old Testament is for Esther and Ruth. Now I'm going to go find my studies right now. Have been echoed in the book of Revelation. Which means, if I'm going to understand the book of Revelation, what do I have to understand? I've got to understand at least 37 out of the 39 books of the Old Testament. That's what that means. Okay? Now let me take that a little deeper, okay? Can, 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 can I go a little deeper with you on that one? Well, even if you say no, I'm still going to go a little deeper. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me go a little deeper with you on that. If I got up on Easter Sunday this next spring and told the resurrection story, I may live out, leave out some details about the resurrection story. Because I may not try to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and also 1 Corinthians 15, which tells us some things about the resurrection story. So what I could do, Bob, is I could, I could lay out, I've done this, I could lay out for you the sequence of events leading up from, from Christ's betrayal up until Jesus Christ ascended the Father. Okay? But especially just take the, the resurrection. Lord's Day morning, Sunday morning, and a few days thereafter when Jesus appears. If I were to get up and tell you stories about the resurrection, I may not tell you everything about the resurrection. But you probably know enough about those, the resurrection story. You say, oh yeah, now Bob didn't mention this. But he did mention this. But I remember Peter and John ran to the tomb. I remember Mary went and she thought the gardener was speaking to her. I remember that one gospel writer says there were two angels. Another gospel writer says there was one angel sitting outside the empty tomb. One gospel writer says this happened. The other gospel writer doesn't even mention that. And so, Bob, what we do is we piece together the resurrection story, but I can tell you the general truth of the resurrection story without giving every detail. Okay? So here's what happens, Mike. Let me take the Exodus as an example of Revelation 8 and 9. When John relies quite heavily on the ten, on several of the plagues, not all ten plagues, but several of the plagues, he is assuming that the people would know the background. He's assuming they would know all of the plagues. He can assume they would know that these plagues were pronounced against Egypt in order to bring judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt because Pharaoh and Egypt had, had enslaved the people of God. He's assuming, you see, that they would have filled in the blanks. Now, here's what I've discovered in preaching in, my, in, our, in our culture. As a guest preacher, see, I, I don't hold, I, I, I do not have, I do not have the demands that a Bob and Dave have in preparing a new sermon week in and week out and knowing people, where they're coming from, what they know, what they don't know. So I take a risk when I come to preach. And I'm, quite frankly, the older I get, the more uncomfortable I am because sometimes I wonder, am I able to connect with people still? Because I wondered that in the seminary classroom because of the learning styles of my seminary students. I wonder about that when I preach, Bob, because I may get up and just assume that people know a story of the Bible. And they may not know that story of the Bible. I may get up and say, now, you know, you know, do you recall Jonah and the great fish? Do you recall when Jonah did this and did this and did this? I may leave out some detail of the story. But here's what I found I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to do this in the seminary classroom. I'm having to provide more details. I'm having to provide more information. Because I can no longer assume that my students will have the information the students did 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 minutes ago. Okay? So let me take the example that Mike gave Mike, with, 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 the, with the plagues in Egypt. Even when I said plagues in Egypt and Pharaoh, and about the waters being affected, and about darkness coming upon the kingdom of Egypt. Even with those highlights that I just gave you, 
And this is not putting anybody down. I may have lost some of you. Do you understand why I may have lost some of you? Because you may not have read that story about the Exodus in years, or you may never have heard that story. But I go back to the question that someone asked over here to my right, not here, over here, Christine. She was saying, right, right there, right? Is what she was saying? She's not there now, is she? I don't know. But okay, okay. When she asked me, she said, well, would the, would the Gentiles have been able to understand? Yeah, that was their Bible. They would have known the stories. They would have connected the dots. They would have filled the blanks. So I'm going to pause here. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Do I need to clarify? Do I need to give some more illustrations about this? I'm not sure what silence means. <laughs> silence in heaven, 30 minutes, remember, meant judgment was coming. So I'm not sure what silence at Moonlight Church means on Saturday morning. So let me ask you this question. What are you hearing me say so far? I'm repeating some stuff, but I'm also in some new stuff, all right? I'm giving some additional material, okay, that I did not give you last week to try to underscore to re-emphasize the principle I gave you last week. <coughs> what have you heard me say so far? Yes? Um, that John takes to reveal spiritual truth. Yes. I, I, I wish I would have phrased that in my first volume. It will be in the second volume instead of just wrote it down. Uh, uh, John takes literally events, people, places, numbers, things, colors, animals, institutions like temple, synagogue, Sanhedrin, whatever. He takes them and they become symbols like for deeper spiritual truths. Now that ought not to surprise us because the New Testament does that with regularity. When Jesus says, for example, you destroy this temple in three days I will raise it, it will be, I will be raised up. What did Jews think he was talking about? The building. But what was Jesus talking about? His body. Okay? He takes a real place now, 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 you understand? Now, now, pick this up. Oh, my. Hey, how about this? I'm glad you said, repeat that for me, okay? Okay? You've got a literal temple. You've got the literal... I'm taking notes on myself. You've got the literal temple. You've got a literal temple. Jesus says, you destroy this temple in three days, it will be raised. What did temple symbolize? What did it represent? God's presence. Why would Jesus link himself to the temple? Because he's God present. Okay? Then you've got the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 6 saying what about Christians? What did they say about Christians? The church? We have a temple. He takes a real event, a real place, and now, 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 what does it mean that we are the temple? I've got a trick question. You know the answer to that? God dwells in us. Now, let me take that a step further. If you want to talk about this, we can talk about it during the break. Maybe. I really don't want to get into it. <laughs> the temple is not going to be rebuilt on this planet. You understand? You understand? There's no need for a temple. Why? Because we use the temple. Okay, that's all. Have, you, have you heard some say, oh, the sacrifice can be started all over again? Have you heard that you point being espoused by well known preachers? The sacrifice can be started all over again? Wait just a minute. What do Hebrews, what do Hebrews say about, about sacrifices? Jesus is the supreme sacrifice. It's done. And in every Lord's Day when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we remember the supreme, the supreme sacrifice that Jesus Christ played. You see, He takes real events, real places, real institutions, real people to teach these spiritual truths. They become timeless. Okay? Thank you. What else have you heard? Who were the priests in Jesus' day? Yeah, the high priest had 16 to 18,000 priests. But in the church, who were the priests? We are the priests. So don't look for there being a priesthood among the Jewish people in the next 
5 or 10 or 15 or 15. We are the priests for goodness sakes. Oh, 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 now, see, I'm on a roll. Okay, I've got to be really careful with this. I've got to be really careful. Otherwise, I will not get through what I would like to get through today. Not going to tell you what I need to get through, but what I would like to get through. Christ is supreme sacrifice, right? But what does Paul say about the Christian life in Romans? Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to what? Present yourselves as living sacrifices. As Christ, so we. But our sacrifice is different. Our sacrifice is not the sin of the world. Our sacrifice is a gift offering, love offering to God, saying we give our life to the over to you. It takes a real event, the sacrificial event, to apply to Jesus Christ and to apply to us. John does the same thing. So what John does in Revelation is done elsewhere by Jesus, Peter, Paul, and other of the other apostles. What else do you hear? Yes? That during the setting, you said that conflict was happening. Just a second. I'm going to step off, and I know I'm going to go off the street a bit. That's okay. Repeat that. During the story setting, you mentioned that conflict was happening between Christians and Rome. That that story shows us how to live in a time of conflict now. Apply. Yes. There has never been a time in the history of the church, in the history of the Christian faith, or in the history of the Jewish people, in which there has not been conflict. Okay? It has always gone on. It will always go on. We are always in tribulation. Tribulation comes and goes, ebb and flow. The church is always going through tribulation. There is always conflict. So get over this. You ain't going to be raptured for tribulation. Because Christians of the Lord Jesus Christ are already being tri undergoing tribulation and they've not been raptured. Talk to them in China, talk to them in Indonesia. Talking to him, why is it we white folk in America are going to be raptured? Okay, when well, the rest of the world has already gone through some tribulation. Do you understand how narrow that particular view is? <coughs> Whereas Revelation makes a broader view says, you know what? All of God's people can experience, if their faith can experience, not necessarily will, but can experience opposition. What else have you heard me say? Okay, let's move to symbolism. Symbolism, real quick. Symbolism related sources because all of John's symbols, most of John's symbols, most of John's symbols come out of the Old Testament. Which means, coming back to you, if he takes real people, real events, real places, and he teaches you, they, they become symbols of teach spiritual truths. Okay? So does that mean then that I deny? Does that mean that I deny the message of Revelation? No. I think I can get a hold of the message of Revelation when I understand the nature of symbolic language. Remember, I read to you last week from the, the King James Version. He sent and signified it. He sent and made it known in signs and symbols. Why are symbols used? Sometimes to describe the indescribable. Why are symbols used? Because sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Why are symbols used? Because they provoke emotions, both good and bad. And so you've got colors and numbers and animals and pieces of furniture and buildings and people and dates and all these things uh, being used that were literal, being used to portray something symbolic. Okay? Now, let me give you this illustration. I'm going to try this out and see if it makes sense to you. I'm saying to you today that the book of Revelation was timely for John's audience because it takes, it uses symbols, images, metaphors, that would have been well known in the Old Testament times and how it spoke to John's people in their time. So it's timely. But I'm also saying that the book of Revelation is timeless. It's both timely and it's timeless. And it's timeless because those same symbols, those same metaphors, Simulates whatever word you use the word like or as. Those same symbols, whatever, 
continue to speak to us today. But Bob, in order for me to know, in order for me to know their timelessness, I've got to see how they were timely back then. I've got to know what they meant. And so here's what happens, if I can do it like this. You've got the Old Testament. Here's what something meant. You've got the New Testament of John's day. Here's what something meant. And when you take those together then, you can say, here is what it means to us today. Okay? Now, let me build on this for the next <clears throat> Two years ago, and I, I got permission to tell from Marilyn to tell you this. Two years ago, Marilyn turned 60. And I think at a very delicate age, I discovered. And uh, she turned 60. And I said, what do you want to do to celebrate your 60th birthday? And Marilyn said she wanted to go to Chicago to see a performance at the Goodman Theater of um, the musical, or the story, a Christmas carol, much like this. Okay? I'll tell you what happened. This was uh, 2007 we went to see a Christmas carol. It is a remarkable presentation, by the way. The year that we were there happened to be the 30th anniversary of the Christmas carol. The 30th anniversary of them showing, uh, performing the Christmas carol at the Goodman Theater. Christmas carol by Dickens, huh? I'm assuming you know who I'm talking about, Charles Dickens, Christmas Carol. Go down here, Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey is showing here at your local theater. I'll, I'll go see it, okay? Christmas Carol, it was written in 1843, I think. I have seen many, many movie versions of it. I've seen a couple of stage productions. But I remember, I remember we, we, we got into our, 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 our chairs, our seats, and I was going through the souvenir program and noticed that the 30th anniversary of performing the Goodman Theater. And they had pictures in the bulletin of the program of the various men who played Ebenezer Scrooge over the years. And uh, uh, they had a picture of people who played Scrooge with their actors' names. And so I jumped into the current cast of Ebenezer Scrooge, that was the first year this particular actor was ever going to play Ebenezer Scrooge. And I noticed, though, that there was a character who goes into Ebenezer Scrooge's shop and asks him to any money, and that's where Scrooge utters those memorable lines, Bah Humbug, where a man asks Ebenezer Scrooge for a donation. Well, I noticed, Bob, in the program that the man who had that very small role played the very first Ebenezer Scrooge 30 years before the Goodman Theater. So he, he's much older now. He cannot, the energy demanded of that. He, he, he had a very big part. At the very end of the presentation then, when the cast came out to take their, to take their vows, they came up for a second curtain call, and this was so neat. The first Ebenezer Scrooge, who had a big role, and the most recent Ebenezer Scrooge came out to conclude the curtain call and held each other, you know, arm in arm, and they bowed. And I stood and I cheered. And I, there were a few others, because we had read the program, we knew what was going on. I turned to Mary and said, do you know what they just did? I said, they just took the first Ebenezer Scrooge that was going to be most recent one, and they had them acknowledge the applause. And Mary looked at me and she said, you think too much. Thank you, Mary. So we went out for dinner that night with some friends of ours, another husband and wife, and the woman celebrates her birthday as well, at the same time my wife did. And we went back to the hotel room and I, uh, I came up with this illustration. Over the years, there have been many people play the role of Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, Jacob Marley, Tiny Tim, Bob Pratchett. The ghost of Christmas, past, present, and future. Right? There have been many actors play. Many actors play there. On stage productions and movies. I mean, you've got Mickey, Mickey's Christmas Carol and Mickey Mouse. Okay? You've got the one with George C. Scott, the one with El Elster Sin. You've got, uh, you've got one the Goodman Theater in Chicago. So you have the same cast of characters 
but you have different actors play them over the years. So now stick with me on this. I, I think this will help you see what John does with Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you have a cast of characters like God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, Satan. You've got a sea beast, an earth beast. You've got Babylon. You've got a host of people, a host of places. Now in John's day, and throughout the century, God always plays God. Christ always plays the role of Christ. Holy Spirit always the role of Holy Spirit. Satan always plays the role of Satan. He is out there changes. Sometimes not bright red. Sometimes it's um, white. Huh? Right? Did Paul Small say that? He'll appear pure and spotless. So you've got, but, but the beast. But if what the beast, how to see the beast on the earth was anti Christian Roman government and anti Christian Roman religion when the emperor's working with God, maybe you have other actors play out the same role in different cultures, in different countries. In John's day, Rome was like Babylon. Well, there have been other Babylon for the centuries. As there was a Babylon in Daniel's day, so there's a Babylon in John's day. So there may have been a Babylon in the 4th century AD, 5th century, 10th century, 21st century. You have the same type of characters, but you have different actors playing many of those characters. Is this making sense to you? And so therefore, for example, John talks about um, Balaam in Revelation 2 and Jezebel in Revelation 2. Balaam. Anybody know the story about Balaam? If you, if you raise your hand, I'm going to say, tell me the story. But, but think about just for a minute, you, what do you know about Balaam? Well, when I ask my seminary students a question like that, I'll never ask about Balaam. They'll say, oh yeah, he had a donkey to talk. <laughs> okay, can you tell me more? Yeah, he had a donkey to talk. <laughs> okay, a little bit more? Well, you see, the story of Balaam is told in Numbers 22 through 24 and Numbers chapter 31. Now, when John says, you've got some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, Turn to Revelation 2. Look at Revelation 2, please. Revelation 2, verse 13 and following. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Amphus, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Ah. Now when Jesus talks there, he's assuming that they'll know the story about Balaam. Balaam was approached by Balak, king of Moab. How do I get these Israelites to sin? Well, you get them to do two things. Worship other gods and commit sexual immorality, and you, you, you got it. You got it. Because Balak was scared of the Israelites. So here's what happens there is a Balaam like group in this church. And what are they teaching the people? Idolatry, immorality. Go to Jezebel. Go to chapter 2. Thought you the time of Hiram. Verse 19. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, that your latter works extend, exceed first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to replace, to practice sexual morality, and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual morality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bag, and those who have been adulterated with her I will throw upon into great tribulation, 
unless they repent of her work trying to strike her children dead. Ah, you know what? Probably we know the story of Jezebel better than we know the story of David. Okay, Jezebel, was she a good queen or a bad queen? Bad queen. She taught the people of God to love, to worship the Baals, the Baal, B-A-A-L-S. And the worship of the Baals or the Baal involved not only idolatry, but involved sexual morality. She was a queen in the land of Israel, married to the king of Israel, and she misled God's servants. There is a woman in the church of Thyatira who is like Jezebel. Now her name is not Jezebel, by the way. No Jew, no Christian would name her daughter Jezebel. Do you understand why? Like, like my son-in-law and daughter are expecting a third child. We don't know if it's a boy or girl yet. But if it's a boy, if the child is a boy, they're not going to name they're not going to name their son Benedict Arnold Mullen. Because, it, well, it may have a nice flow to it. But if you know American history, you know that you probably don't want to name your child Benedict Arnold. Like Adolf Hitler. You, you don't name your child those kind of children. Mean, they're associated with evil, okay? So what Jesus is doing is, you've got a woman who is like Jezebel. So that fits in with this analogy here. Have there been other Baals? Have there been other Jezebels? Have there been other Babylons? Other beasts? Now that fits in, you see, with the symbolism of the book, the structure, the sources of the book, the Old Testament converges with the symbolism. That fits in with the structure of the book. Wouldn't that, that's kind of a neat way to emphasize the final point. The structure of the book, Remember, a lot of people read the book in a linear way, or like a line, this happened, this happened, this is fulfilled. What I'm saying, Bob, is there's always been these scenarios in the history of the church. Now, it's a snowball. It, it is a, um, not a snowball. It's like a spiral. We are heading toward the final coming. But there's always going to be these evil powers. So we've always got to be ready because we don't know, know at what point the Lord Jesus will return. Are you connected with me? This is pretty heavy stuff. If, if Bob were to sign up for my Revelation class in seminary, you'll hear me say some of this. Different examples probably. But here, so I'm giving you some seminary material, okay? And you may thank God that you're not a seminary student of mine. But I, I, I try, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to present things through analogies, and through simple, clear language. That, that's what I need in order to understand things. So I'm trying to grasp with how can I illustrate this stuff. So what do you hear me say? Because it's almost break time. We're supposed to take a break at 8.45, not 9.45, right? Questions or comments? Does this help? So when I read Revelation, I'm saying, oh my, where are we in chapter 9? Where are we in chapter 16? Where are we in some prophetic kind of thing? Don't even get caught up in that. He who has ears to hear, let me hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, God wants us to know, have the vision, the insight to know, are we living in Babylon or not? Are there Jezebels or not? Are there Balaam's or not? You bet you there are. There is a Balaam present, and there's a Jezebel present, which would say, you know what? Now, this, will be, this is going to be for Bob. You know what? It's okay to practice homosexuality. That is the cry of Jezebel. That's the cry of Balaam, isn't it? Because you and I, if you and I know, our children and our grandchildren will live to see her. Even though it's okay to, be, to, to commit incest. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. Because once you once you once you remove the line, the boundary, you're, I mean, who, who, who determines the boundary? Does the majority determine the boundary? Truth is never determined by the majority, is what John the Apostle says. Truth is determined by God. And so therefore, just as much as Jezebel was assimilating with the culture of her day and teaching the people to come alongside culture, get along with culture, go along with culture, or get along with culture, so the same pressure is present on the churches today. 
to not speak the truth in love, but nevertheless speak the truth. Okay? So that means Revelation, again, is timeless. It speaks to us. I would pray to God that if these recordings of whatever we're doing here this weekend were around 15 or 20 or 25 years from now, there'd be nothing that I have said that, first of all, was false, and second of all, was trying to predict the future in great detail as to when Jesus Christ was coming again. This makes it timeless, you see. Okay? Let's take a break. 15 minutes break. Bob, announcement to make about that. Yeah, we're, uh...